Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this icy morning. Um, I am Lisa. I'm, we're here at the Osterville Village Library, and I'm pleased to um, welcome Anthony Samarco, who is a great friend of the library, very generous with his time, um, and has uh, is well loved, I know, in the community. So welcome, Anthony. Thank you. You Thank are. You. It's true. <laughs> wow. It's really a pleasure to be here on such an icy cold morning, and I want to welcome not only you in person, but also the people that are on Zoom. This is a book that's in a series of what I call Traditions in Boston, and it started in some ways with a company called Font Hill Media in London. Alan Sutton, who is the publisher, started Arcadia Publications. And you probably know those books. They're the sepia tone covers of every city, town, village, and crossroads in the United States. He sold the company about a decade ago and lived in Provence, but he couldn't actually do anything in publishing according to a legal decree until very recently. So when he started republishing books, he asked me if I would like to write for him. And of course, I jumped at the chance. So I did series of books that were really quite fun, but I started this Traditions in Boston, which was things that we might think of as shared memories. So there is a Christmas traditions in Boston, a Thanksgiving traditions in Boston. This year came out not only Easter traditions in Boston, but Valentine's Day traditions in Boston. And this fall, there will be the wonderful one, Halloween traditions in Boston. So these are things in full color photographs, if the original is in color, that not only chronicle the history of the event, but also show things that we'll remember as children. In a lot of ways, when I teach at the Boston University Metropolitan College, and previous to that for two decades at the Urban College of Boston, I try to make my students think outside the box. And history is more than just names, plates, dates, as well as anything else that is usually taught on a secondary level. I try to make people not only realize in some ways that Boston history is a fascinating glimpse, and I give them the leeway to write about what they are interested in. So if it are male students, and usually I have many hockey players that are there on scholarship who write all about sports, but I also have a grouping of people that will choose one of 25 different topics. So in some ways, it makes it more enjoyable for them, and they excel in the class. I do the same thing in writing books, and this is my 85th book. I'm very proud of it. I think in some ways, when I look at it with the cover, which I did not choose, but suggested, and I see two children at the age of five kissing one another after they exchange Valentine's cards, you begin to realize in some ways how special this was in the 20th and now the 21st century. Well, the whole idea about this is that we realize it's not moving. Sorry. Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm fine. Very good. When we realize in some ways that this is um, come closer, you know, so, okay. <laughs> All right, very good. When we think though of the Valentine's cards of the recent past, they're usually beautifully done and very indicative of a printed card. But beginning in the 1830s and 1840s, London began to produce cards that Charles Dickens called a Cupid's Manufactories. These were factories throughout the city that actually had women working in line fashion to produce cards, and they were imported to the United States. Well, in the 1840s, there was a man by the name of Howland that lived in Worcester, Massachusetts, and he would import some of these cards to sell at his stationery and graphic store that was in Worcester, and they did extremely well. But he would have a daughter by the name of Esther Allen Howland, who would actually make these cards by hand. She was a graduate of Mount Holyoke College in 1852, and after graduation, she worked at her father's store, but she began to produce these cards, as we see, by hand from a variety of substances. It wasn't just paper lace, but gilding, as well as a wreath of flowers, and it says, Valentine, fain would I guard thee through life's desert drear, the find around thee love of soothe and cheer. For thee I live, I might, but I call thee mine. I be forever thine own Valentine. Mm -hmm. Well, she not only did the cards, but she wrote the captions, and she would eventually have a factory in Worcester that employed many women. 
But when I was doing this book, I was doing tremendous amounts of reading to find out who was St. Valentine? Who was this man that we named this holiday after? And obviously, he was obviously the patron saint of lovers. But it turned out that St. Valentine was a priest who lived in the fourth century AD in Rome. He was somebody who not only tried to convert not only other Romans or pagans, but even the emperor, Marcus Aurelius. And eventually, because of his convictions, converting to Christianity, he would be jailed. And seen here, he's offering the not only wine and bread of Christ to the fellow prisoners, but he actually has a wonderful halo directly above. Well, during this period of time, St. Valentine himself was always said to be a very godly and saintly man. But he also, in some ways, was somebody who would be beheaded. And ironically, he was beheaded on February 14th, not years predicted, but it was probably around 356 AD. In this instance, this is from a detail of a much larger illuminated manuscript of the 15th century, and it shows uh, St. Valentine on his knees about to be beheaded. But during this period of time, he was becoming in some ways not just a saint, but he was glorified because of the aspect of introducing Romans to Christianity. Well, this was a painting that actually shows him with Lucila, and Lucila was a woman that he actually converted to Christianity. This was a scandal in ancient Rome because she happened to be the daughter of the emperor, Marcus Aurelius. And by embracing Roman Catholicism, and you see it on the right-hand side as she kneels before St. Valentine, she was a person in some ways that where her convictions were stronger because, of course, even though she was of imperial status, she and her husband were beheaded. So St. Valentine himself was a martyr to this aspect, but converting people was a major part. But by the period of the Middle Ages, and this is a German painting of about 1600, he became the patron saint of epileptics. And you see here on the lower right-hand side, a man who was having convulsions. I was an epileptic as a child, and I had a form called petit mal syndrome. So it would be something I would outgrow by the age of 15, which I did, thankfully. Many people have what is called grand mal. And they would have it throughout their lifetimes. Epileptics in that period of time were thought to be possessed. And here, of course, St. Valentine blesses the epileptic and became the patron saint of epilepsy. But he would also become the patron saint of beekeepers. And this is a detail of a stained glass window that dates to the 18th century in Ireland. And with his staff, he actually holds a bee skeep. And in that instance, bees not only look to him, but as the patron saint, we all pray to him that our bees will actually produce honey. Well, St. Valentine, in this instance, was somebody who was a Christian martyr. But what did he really actually do? Well, it came down to the 19th century when we realized what he did was to introduce love. And the whole aspect of a Cupid with a bow and arrow is something that we've all seen throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. But it's also something in some ways that actually is almost an icon of the greeting card industry. And during that period, you began to see in some ways that these greeting cards, which would start in Worcester, Massachusetts in the early 1850s, they did import them previous to that time in the 1830s and 40s, would actually be made in the United States. Well, this is a card that Esther Allen Howland actually made. It probably dates to 1847. It says happiness at the top, and it's a card that opens. But the cover itself, as you can see here, not only has paper lace, but cut out flowers as well as fauna down below that creates a very attractive card. She would eventually write a book that actually had all sorts of different things that you might actually copy out of that book to write to your love interest on the inside. But these were a thing that actually sold tremendously well. She herself, as I mentioned earlier, was one of the very few women in the early part, or should I say mid 19th century, that was to be educated. Mount Holyoke was a new school that had been established by Mary Lyon in 1848, and she would be one of the first graduates in 1852. In that instance, not only is she equipped with a classical education, but she was also somebody in that instance that had a business sense. 
During the 19th century, she set up a small factory, so to speak, at her dining room table where a group of women would assist her, each doing peace work and being paid by the peace. But in that period, her cards would sell from anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar. And it sounds ridiculous today, but in the 1850s and 60s, that was a tremendous sum of money. But she actually, in this instance, would make cards as we see here. Now, this is actually paper that has been cut out of a die cut, but everything else is affixed by hand. They were labor intensive, and a card could take anywhere from a half hour to an hour to actually produce. And you weren't paid by the time you put into it, you were paid by according to the piece. In the very center, you have a Cupid dressed as a jester, and you realize that the snowdrops and all of the paper cutting and the flowers are things that are very attractive. But in this instance, she herself would actually employ by the 1870s upwards of 24 women, mostly single women or widows that needed to actually have income to support themselves and their families. And here at that dining room table, she did very well. Eventually by 1875, she actually moved this from her dining room table to a factory in Worcester where she had upwards of 50 employees, both men and women who worked on the paper, as well as the printing, as well as the cutting out of the individual pieces. And she has become known as the mother of the Valentine Day card. This one done in 1865 at the height of the Civil War shows a woman with a hoop skirt with a crinoline made out of paper, along with two cupids on either side and a cupid surmounting the entire tableau. These were labor intensive, and you can see that they actually were worth the dollar that people paid, but they were the abnormality. Many of the ones that were imported from London throughout that 1830 through the 1860 period were lovely, but nowhere near as detailed as those coming from Worcester. Well, eventually, not only did her parents die, but her brother became critically ill. And in 1882, she sold the company and it was reincorporated as the New England Valentine Company in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, what he did was, and this is Joseph Whitney, and we'll speak about him in a moment. He created in some ways, not only the successor firm to Holland, but he also did things in a way that he used the printing press. Whereas most of her cards were done by hand and beautifully done, he now could create cards at 15 to 20 per minute in such a way that not only had the color and detail, but were one dimensional. And seen here with Valentine's, the number and letters actually on each red heart began to realize that this period of the late 19th century would corner the market. Now, Joseph Whitney, seen here in the early part of the 20th century, was a brevet colonel during the Civil War, and his family was really quite comfortable. With his brother, he had established the New England Valentine Company. And in that instance, 80% of the Valentines printed in the United States in the 19th century came from his factory in Worcester, Massachusetts. He himself would hire not just men to work on the paper, but he hired numerous women that actually painted designs that could then be printed. In that instance, they were really quite special. This card, which dates to about 1905, again shows in a three-dimensional quality, but it is one-dimensional. Not only a young boy in the center, he's actually placed a Valentine card on a nail on the door. Hopefully somebody will find it. <laughs> But in that instance, you see the four hearts in either corner, but this wonderful die cut that creates a wonderful undulating aspect. Everything was printed, and it wasn't something that was a great deal of work to do. But these became sentimental Valentine's Day cards that you could send to a love interest or to mother or father or even children. He also presented this, which was a young boy who's acted as a newsboy and it says extra February 14th to my Valentine. And within this heart shaped piece of paper with punch cut lace around the edges, you began to realize that these were the types of things in the very early part of the 20th century that our grandparents would have exchanged. 
Well, in some ways, he had done so well that by the 1920s, and this photograph is from 1921, he had upwards of 75 employees. Now, the George Whitney Company survived three generations and would only cease operations in 1942 at the height of the uh, World War II, simply because they actually lacked all of the supplies they needed. Mr. Whitney is the fourth from the right. He actually is a very large man. He's done quite well for himself. But you can see the fact that this was something that was a success because of his employees. And there are women as well as men who made, in that instance, his factory that produced Valentine's and later greeting cards of all different holidays as something that was really quite important. Well, by the earlier part of the 1890s, advertising and ephemera was an important part for businesses to actually show how they actually advertised. And this is actually a paddle that you would fan yourself with. And it's a piece of paper, hard stock paper. And it says Valentine's. They're being sold wholesale and retail at Triffitt's at 25 School Street in Boston. Well, Triffitt's was the premier stationary store in Boston, and School Street was a major street that connected Tremont Street and Washington Street. And this card, of course, was something that not only advertised the company, but said that they were dealing in Valentine's Day cards. And at that time, they weren't displayed as we might see. You would actually go in and ask for a small display to be given to you so that you could look through them. This is a print of about 1905. It actually shows an earlier type of a card or stationery store. You could buy books, you could buy stationery, as well as cards. And the young woman behind the counter shows the gentleman, of course, a selection of Valentine's Day cards. Well, in that way, Boston, which was one of the major cities on the East Coast, began in some ways to show Valentine's as a holiday as early as the 1840s. Now, this is an etching that would appear in Gleason's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion. It had been started by Frederick Gleason, a German immigrant. And in 1842, he established the first illustrated newspaper in Boston. Seen here, a woman on the lower right-hand side clasps her fingers together as she wonders who is sending her a Valentine's card. Well, in the very center, there is a pudai actually dressed as a mailman, and he's pulling the doorknob. I don't know if you've ever seen these. I lived in an old house at one time that had a doorknob you pulled, and it rang the bell inside. I loved it. But the whole idea was if I didn't answer the door, people continued to pull. <laughs> but here you see him not only with one Valentine, but look on the left-hand side. It's an avalanche. She was obviously a popular bell. But Gleason himself was somebody who began to use these things with all sorts of poems that commemorated St. Valentine's Day, and it was a major holiday. Here, one in 1847, shows a woman having just returned home. Her cloak and bonnet are on the table behind her, and she opens a Valentine's card. But look at all the cupids directly above, holding hearts, and of course, cascading Valentine's down and the men directly below that are sending them to their love interests. Well, these were a major part of 19th century Boston. And this etching, which actually shows people in front of the Nichols House Museum, a house designed by Charles Bullfinch and built in 1804 on Mount Vernon Street on Beacon Hill, of a group of three women stopping the mailman. It actually was done in 1904. They didn't wait for him to arrive at their homes with their Valentines. They wanted them out of the bag immediately. Well, in that way, Valentines being sent either by hand or now by mail was a major part of the economics of February of every year. But one man who cornered the market in Boston was a man named Louis Prang. You might know the name. There's a Louis Prang Avenue in Boston's Fenway where the Boston Public Library, uh, Boston um, Latin School is located. But Prang was a man who immigrated from Germany in 1848, and he was a printer by trade. But by the 1850s, he had become one of the best known lithographers in the country. 
And seen here, this was a card done in 1875 that would actually appear wherever Prang's Valentine cards were sold. It was a very large billboard, and it shows a woman with a sheet on her hair, uncombed and uncoiffed, and she's holding in her hand what would have actually have been an umbrella handle, but she's actually holding pudai that float in the air like balloons. What surprises me in 1875 is that there is an African-American pudai, which seemed somewhat interesting at the period. But Prang himself was somebody that not only was well-versed in lithography, but he would do etchings and scenes that actually replicated paintings that you could frame and hang in your home. During the period of the 1870s and early 1880s, he became known as the father of the Christmas card because it was he who produced the first American-made Christmas card. But by the 1870s, he was also beginning to show various other greeting cards for every other holiday. During this period of time, his factory, which the building still stands in Roxbury's Meeting House Hill, he produced a series of things, including Prang's art chart. Maybe you remember when you were a child, there were charts on the wall and they would pull it down and each of the colors would actually say what they would become if they were combined. Made no difference to me, I was colorblind, but the whole idea was in that instance, he was well known until his death in 1915. But here is another placard that would be placed where Prang's cards were sold. And they weren't just sold in Boston, but they were sold throughout the country. And Prang's Valentine's, as you can see, was a major feature with an angel, a crown, a heart, as well as his bow and arrow. Prang during this period of time had upwards of 150 employees, 60% of them women. And the women would actually not only do drawings and paintings that would then be transmitted to lithographic stones, but they became well known. Lithography is unlike printing, something you would carve each individual stone for what would eventually be dipped into an ink and then overlaid on the paper so that this does look like a print, but it might have five or six different colors from a lithographic stone. And this card, which dated to the 1880s, is somewhat unique. It shows a heart pierced by an arrow. My remembrance, say Valentine's Day. Doesn't sound very romantic to me. But he was somebody who in a lot of ways would also produce cards for children. And seen here with a cat on the left with her fan at the ready, and the male cat in the center with his stat collar and umbrella says, oh, listen to my plaintive muse, nor this my Valentine refuse. But look at the expression of the cat popping his head out of the <laughs> chimney. So you began to realize that these were things that many of these people, both men and women, were drawing and would then become a Christmas card or even a postcard. Well, in that way, it was one of many cards that were done. But during this research on Valentine's Day traditions, I found out that there were a series of things that we might not really have realized, including a sailor's Valentine. Now, you might remember a couple of years ago, there was a wonderful exhibit here at the library on sailor's Valentines. And it was said in some ways that in the 19th century, sailors during their off time on these ocean cruises, as well as whaling ships, would actually make these sailors' valentines out of seashells. It's pretty far-fetched, but during the period of the 1840s through the 1860s, there was a German man who actually lived in Barbados, and seen here, it's dated January of 1847, that had a group of local women who actually collected the shells and would create these geometric designs within an octagonal wooden box. And they were things that you could actually purchase and take home, yes, for your love interest, your mother, your aunt, or even your daughter. And this instance, with a heart in the center, these were beautifully done. But the whole aspect was they were called sailor's valentines, and simply for the fact the sailor had purchased them in Barbados and brought them home. Well, this is by Courier and Ives. It's a print that was done in the 1840s. It shows the sailor, I hope that's his wife, <laughs> as he arrives at home with the clipper ship in the harbor to the left. 
And in that way, not only did he probably bring home all sorts of exotic things, but he brought home maybe a Valentine's that was called the Sailor's Valentine. This was a double hinge Sailor's Valentine, always octagonal boxes with all sorts of individual shells that were placed in that instance in a design. But they also had spaces where you could insert a photograph of yourself or a child that would then be given to your love interest. These were very popular and today they've become highly collectible. 19th century examples that are in very good condition can sell from two to $3,000. The whole aspect was in the mid 20th century, sailors' valentines were taken to a new height thanks to the Cahoons. Now we all know the Cahoon Museum on the Falmouth Road in Pituit, but Ralph and Martha Cahoon seen here in a photograph of the 1950s were not just well-known artists, but they actually would produce sailors' valentines. This is a photograph that shows them working at a pine trestle table. On the left-hand side, Ralph Cahoon is painting his mermaids. You've probably seen them. Wimpy's has a wonderful exhibit of different prints of Cahoon's museum pieces. We see mermaids playing baseball at Lowell Park. We see mermaids flirting with sailors sitting on a fence, or we see them ascending into a heaven in a balloon. But on the right-hand side, Martha Cahoon is doing these group scenes. And yes, even mermaids come into her equation as well. Well, they had a turn of the 19th century house where they raised their son. And during that instance, Martha Cahoon would work with a man by the name of Ben Woodman, a man who actually was physically infirm, but he was a master at gluing these individual shells to create three-dimensional views. Now, again, it's an octagonal box, but each of the shells themselves are much more vivid. The colors are greater, and there's a more variety of the individual shells. When he finished, Martha Cahoon would place within that circle a painting that she had done. And in this instance, it's a mermaid and a merman canoodling in a <laughs> clamshell. And we realize in that instance, it's not only whimsical, but it's something in some ways that provided income for Mr. Woodman, who needed the income because of his infirmity. But some of the things she did, and this is my very favorite, would not only be within a Woodman design as a surround, but she did something of a whaling ship. Now, we all know, of course, Herman Melville wrote Moby Dick. And Moby Dick actually talked about Captain Ahab and Mocha. Dick, as he was really known, as a major part of the economy of the 1840s to the 1860s. Well, not only did she paint a wonderful whaling ship with the American flag, and notice on the left-hand side an ascending balloon. I bet there's a mermaid in there somewhere. <laughs> but on the bottom, she glued a piece of ivory that's carved as a whale. So this became something that was a replica of 19th century originals but was so more beautiful and so much more typical of the things that we would see coming out of New England that it's probably worth even more than the original. Sailor's Valentines were important, but so too weren't Krampus Valentines. Now, Krampus is somebody who said, is said to be the antithesis of Santa Claus. He was not only a devil, he had horns, he had a foot that was actually a hoof, and the other was actually a hairy claw foot. He was covered in hair, and he was somebody, as it says here in German, greetings from the Krampus. He hops the fence with a Valentine's heart directly behind him, and he holds a branch of twigs, something that he was said to beat young children with into submission. Well, in some ways, Krampus cards dated to the 17th and 18th century, and many children growing up in Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Czech Republic would see him as somebody who was to be feared. Well, many people realize that here he is, chains around his neck, hearts in his basket on his back, as well as those birch branches. He's now impaling hearts that he would roast over an open fire. I don't know if these hearts are crying or whether they're sweating, 
but it says Bruce von Krampus, greetings from the Krampus. It's a great card. I wish I would get one. <laughs> but he also was somebody who knew how to break a heart. But in this instance, with his mandolin, he would slice the hearts into a very thin sliver. He knew how to break it. Well, in that instance, whether it was Sailor's Valentine's, Krampus cards, or even Vinegar Valentine's, you began to realize in the 19th and early 20th century, these were pretty interesting. <laughs> well, here a woman holds a lemon, and it says, to my Valentine, tis a lemon that I hand you and bid you now skidoo. Because I love another, there is no chance for you. So this man doesn't say it very nicely, but sends her a postcard. And in that instance, she realizes she's been dumped. Well, Vinegar Valentine's actually touched upon every aspect of society. Whatever your sin, there was one card just for you. In this instance, there was Miss Nosy. And the woman has a nose that is really quite incredible. And on account of your talk of others' affairs, and meet at dances, you sit uh, by the stairs. No one wants to know you because you know everyone's business. Mm -hmm. She was really quite a sad person. And there was also the cheap state. <laughs> if you ever spent a dollar, folks would think you went insane cause the way you squeeze a penny makes Abe Lincoln scream with pain. And there was also the bar fly. Just keep right on drinking far more hooch than you're able, and you'll wind up good and stinking underneath the barroom table. Well, these were things that, again, were sent for a penny, but they actually touched upon some of people's more sensitive sides. So whether it was a vinegar valentine, or it was a Krampus valentine, or there was a sailor's valentine, they were really quite unique, but they were also very popular. But when we think of cards of the early 20th century, most of us think of not only a beautiful woman surrounded by a, a suite of cards, a suit of cards is the heart suit. And to my Valentine, queen of my heart, it was very indicative of the holiday. And we see here, of course, love offering to my Valentine, a heart encircled with beautiful flowers, simply printed, one-sided, a postcard, very inexpensive, and for a penny, you could send it to a variety of people. But in that way, there were also very well-known graphic artists that took Valentine's Day to new heights. Now, this shows the Cupid, not only with his bow and arrow and his quiver, but we realize that this was done by Joseph Ladersacker. Now, Ladersacker was a Hungarian immigrant. He had come to this country in 1905 with his family, but he went on to become one of the best known graphic artists and working for Saturday Evening Post for over 30 years. This was a drawing that he had done that actually was done in oils that he actually would use in a 1925 cover of the Saturday Evening Post. And seen here as a young man, this was a man who over 40 years devoted his life to graphic design. One of his earliest commissions was to draw the Arrow Man for Arrow shirts. And you might remember these. They were typical things of gentlemen in very richly starched shirts and heavy collars, beautifully done. But he was someone who did every single holiday. But some of his Valentine's Day cards were incredible, such as this. And as it says, St. Valentine, it shows a very young Cupid, bow and arrow, He's just sent the arrow off with his quiver, covering the private parts. But you see his signature on the lower left-hand side. The unfortunate thing was when he died, his brother put these things into a yard sale. And many things were sold and later destroyed. But there is a small collection that's actually at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. We also had people such as Tasha Tudor. If you've ever heard of Tasha Tudor, she was a well-known writer. Her books on corgi dogs were very popular. And during the period of the 1950s, right through to the early part of this century, she did over 100 books. She herself was born Starling Burgess on Beacon Hill. Uh, her grandfather was Frederick Tudor, the Ice King. So the family had lived on Beacon Street in great wealth. 
But in the period of the 19 teens, when she was a child, she began to dress as a woman from the 1830s and 1840s. She did this throughout her lifetime. And in some ways, seen here with her granddaughter, she lived a rarefied life in a house with no heat, electricity, or hot water with her family antiques, and she painted on a daily basis. She was somebody in some ways that instilled a sense of pride of her Yankee heritage, but her drawings and paintings were things that were really quite fun. Well, this was actually a drawing out of one of her books, and it was called The Sparrow Post. And the sparrow was the postman for this mailbox that was done for her children and later her grandchildren. And you can see the children, parrots, corgis, dogs, even a rabbit and cat, all around the sparrow post. Well, each of the children, including she and her husband, would actually write Valentine's cards to one another. And purportedly, Mr. Sparrow would then actually hold them at his post office. They would then on Valentine's Day open the door and they would actually see the sparrow there with all of their Valentine's cards. They were charming. But Tasha Tudor, as I said, was not only an author of 100 books, but she was somebody in a lot of ways that has become an icon of that wonderful sense of Yankee tradition. Another man was Norman Rockwell. And Norman Rockwell, who was probably one of the best known mid 20th century painters in this country, who chronicled middle class life as a museum in his name in Lenox, Massachusetts. It not only has a wonderful selection of his paintings, but it chronicles the life of this artist. And seen here in his studio, he was somebody who had been painting since the time he was a child. But like Joseph Ladersecker, he too would become a man who did graphic arts for Saturday Evening Post. And this actually shows a young boy, this is from 1924, that actually is being whispered into his ear by a Cupid and of course, it might be the impression of either flowers or candy or a card. But we realize in some ways that Norman Rockwell would be the successor to later Secker at the Saturday Evening Post, and that he would continue these right through the 1960s. But the biggest of all of them was Hallmark cards. And seen here, Joyce um, Hall was a man who actually started the company in the Midwest in the early part of the century. During that period of time, they did greeting cards for almost every holiday, as well as specialty cards, such as birthdays and anniversaries. And by the 1950s, when this factory was built in Des Moines, Iowa, he was somebody who had really cornered the market. And Hallmark cards were among the best that were available. His earliest cards actually look like Howland's cards from Worcester in the 1860s but they're one dimensional, they're printed, but beautifully colored, still in a die cut, but also with things such as a pudai in the very center with a dove sitting in a bird bath, beautiful flowers, and it says at the bottom, for you, Valentine. Well, Joseph Hall himself was somebody who actually had upwards of over 500 employees, all of whom went the gamut from artists and writers of captions as well as the printers. But one of his employees who worked for him for over 50 years was Mary Hamilton. And Mary Hamilton was a very accomplished artist. She actually is painting a child's face. But during that period of time, she did a series of things that included every single holiday. But during Valentine's Day, one of her special things were Mary's bears. bears. And seen here, a small bear wearing a dress, holding a little sheaf of, of red hearts. It says, Happy Valentine's directly above. They were charming. And by this period of the early 1970s, they were being sold in packs of six rather than an individual card. And they were geared towards sending them to mass numbers of people. But remember, Hallmark also did things such as this. Remember V-Day. Fight heartache. And it says, you know what to look for, Hallmark. Buy Hallmark cards today. And if you remember, Hallmark card said, when you can't send the very best, you sent a Hallmark card. But look closely at this Cupid 
probably one of the older Cupids I've ever seen, mm -hmm. bicep, and he has the hallmark crown tattooed on his arm. Very interesting aspect. Some of the cards when we see them, she was more fair than words can say. He's knocked over his little red ink uh, stand, and we realize that this little boy is writing a card for his love life. And we see here, I'm going out to sea, if you will be my Valentine. Well, a sailor actually knows everything. Remember, he did those sailor's Valentines. But the whole aspect was, when we think of Hallmark and sending the very best, this was an advertisement in the 1970s, and it shows a boy masking his face with a textbook as he gives a card to his classmate. She's smiling. She opened it. It was quite lovely, and it really did make a major part. Of course, during that period, whether it was day school or boarding school, you would all basically exchange cards with all of your students. And seen here in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the early 1990s, the children actually place again their Valentine cards into this mailbox, and it says, our Valentine mailbox, happy Valentine's Day. Every child there would actually have one for each of their fellow students. So when we think of a card, it's a wonderful thing to get, but most of us actually get candy on Valentine's Day, whether we need it or not. And seen here, Whitman's for my Valentine was a major part of 19th and early 20th century Boston. Whitman's candies have been made as early as the 1860s, but this is one from the 1940s. And it shows a woman, which is affixed to the red heart, which is velvet. And she has paper laid in such a way that she has a crinoline skirt over a hoop skirt, and she holds a fan. Well, this is one pound in size. But Whitman samplers were things that actually had a selection of things that you might enjoy. Milk chocolate, dark chocolate, and all sorts of other things. But during that period, there is one major chocolate tier in Boston known as Phillips Chocolates that I patronize. The San Martino family are related to me. And seen here, the woman actually fills five pound hearts with all sorts of chocolates. So you could get all milk chocolate or all dark chocolate or a mixture. But they did wonderful things from one pound to five pound to this, which was a 25 pound size. And if you want to be on my good size, this is the one I want. <laughs> Though I'm at tops, I shouldn't be eating it. But seen here, this woman would do these and they sold quite well. Well, Philip's Chocolates, which had begun as early as 1942, has thrived over the years. And with a variety of chocolates, we can choose flowers or candy or a Valentine card. Well, in that instance, when I look at this and I think of Esther Allen Howland, I think in a lot of ways that this photograph shows her as a very successful woman, a businesswoman in Worcester, Massachusetts, well ahead of her time, both in education as well as actually creating a sustainable business. And she says, remember me, I would not that thy form should rise, but when you think of me, remember me. And she was somebody who really we remember today. Today, the, new, the American greeting card industry actually awards a Howland Award annually to the best cards that were produced. So when you think of Valentine's Day, maybe you look at this as something that you might wanna read with a cup of coffee or cocoa, along with a few pieces of candy, we realize that Valentine's Day traditions in Boston is something that not only we share, but we begin to realize in some ways it's rich and ever evolving history. Thank you very much. Two people in chat here. Let's see what they have to say. Let's see. Yes. <laughs> Gail and Steve, so you could so you see that. Yes. We've got one new message. Oh, that's Very nice. nice. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you all on Zoom. Thank you, Anthony. Thank that you. was fabulous. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Please. I didn't want to be.
And many times they did. Um, a lot of times Hummels, which were done on the 1930s and 40s, you know, were a typical thing. And of course, it probably did influence a man who was, yeah. Well, of course, don't forget their, their children who um, in some ways do resemble Hummels at times. But I think in a lot of ways, it's all up to the artist, how they portray children or, or even adults. I, like I say, I never saw a Cupid that age or that size body. But uh, we look at them and we realize it really is kind of fun to see the broad spectrum. Are there any other? Please. Phillips, is that in Chelmsford, Mass? Dorchester, Massachusetts, right at Neponset Circle. Okay, because there is like a maybe for Mrs. Phillips or something. Oh, I see. Oh. Mrs. Nelson. Mrs. Nelson. Oh, okay. oh, that one, yes. Oh, I got that. <laughs> oh, Phillips. Phillips Candy House. Yes. Well, I, I used to have, when I worked in town, I retired last year, the clients would send these boxes of candy. And I would say to myself, I'd come home with these baskets and we'd look at them and it's like, oh my God, what do you do? But it is something that's really special. I mean, I'm sure that a small box of candy is tastes as good as a 25 pound <laughs> box. But, but I think sometimes these are things that, you know, I remember as a child and things of that sort, but this was a book that was really kind of special to me. And when I was writing it, I, I was really kind of happy. So there are lots of quotes in there and things of that sort. I do have a few copies. They sell for 24, but I'm selling them for $20. But they're a great gift, not only for yourself, but they're also a great gift for family and friends. And for Valentine's. Yes, yeah. living in sure. Um, so I can't that yes. all of those Well, that's funny. I just did a post this morning. I don't know if anybody does Facebook, but I have a page called Lost Boston. I've got 20,000 people on that site. So today I did a post on Neko Chalk Candy, let's say Be Mine. They were started by a man named Oliver Chase that was actually located in Boston. And Necco bought them out and started on the Four River Channel in South Boston on the Boston line at South Station. And they made what were called lozenges. They're not very attractive, but they were like the Necco wafers. I always like the chocolate, not necessarily the fruit. But then they began to produce in the early... 19 teens and 20s, the little heart shaped chalk. They really did taste like chalk, <laughs> but at least a dozen or so in a mouth at one time was better than one. <laughs> but uh, they then moved to Cambridge, and Necco had a huge factory near Leachmere Square. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that. another type, and I do have it in here. And what I was very happy about when I did this book was I not only had photographs of, say, the candy, but I had people producing it. So there's a man that I use today on my Facebook page, and his name was Manny Costa. He has a huge thing of plastic on his head, and he's sorting thousands of little hearts. So I have a lot of the people who they are in the book. So I was really kind of pleased how this book came out. Looks like there's another question here. Hold on one sec for a comment. Where did you get your photos of your Valentine's Day cards, including Krampus? Well, <laughs> Krampus is still available on eBay, yeah. but you can also buy them from various uh, purveyors in Europe. Um, not that I'm going to buy any, but mm -hmm. the idea is Krampus, you can actually get them. So I saved them from eBay. Some I did purchase, but they were basically things that I have used them for other books, including Christmas, because there is a Christmas Krampus. But it's something in a lot of ways that many of us don't really know about. Um, younger people seem to be enthralled with Krampus. Maybe it's the birch twigs. I have no idea. <laughs> but in that instance, it really is kind of fun. Well, yes. Yeah. Anthony, just for the record, since we're on Krampus, the very first Krampus card that you showed, that's Hungarian. It is Hungarian. German. Oh, wow. Well, Ellen, if you know, the Reverend Ellen Shahe, actually makes the most wonderful Hungarian food. And I knew she, when I did that card, I thought of Ellen when I was uh, translating it. I don't know if anybody here does translations, but I do translations constantly when I'm reading because though I can read French, I can't always understand what specific words are. 
but I did do that. And greetings from the Krampus was something, it was almost like greeting from hell. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.